Uh, so welcome to the seminar today. And uh, today we are having Jordan Kotler from Harvard, and he's going to talk about his recent paper or recent series of papers on isometric evolution and decentral quantum gravity. So let's hear from him now. Okay, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I'm going to tell you about some recent work over the last year or so in collaboration with Christian Jensen, who's at the University of Victoria, and including some work in progress, but also some work from about a year ago with uh, Andrew Strominger, who is here at Harvard. So the talk is about isometric evolution in Decider quantum gravity. So I'm obligated then to tell you what I mean in particular by isometric evolution and what context for Decider quantum gravity I have in mind. So we will unpack these things in turn. But let's first begin with some questions that will animate the question that will animate the work that we will do. The first question is, do the postulates of quantum mechanics survive in quantum gravity? Now at face value, this is a slightly strange question. One might think that what we mean by quantum gravity is a theory which unifies quantum mechanics and gravity and preserves all of the features or most of the features of both of them. Now, we usually also think that when quantum mechanics and gravity are to be merged together into a single unified theory, that usually it is gravity which bends to the will of quantum mechanics. That if there is something in quantum mechanics such as unitarity that we hold dear to us, that features um, that you would naively expect to find in classical general relativity sometimes get modified in an interesting way in light of quantum effects. But it seems at least logically possible that it could cut the other direction, that in certain contexts, in particular cosmology is what we're going to be interested in here, that features of certain features of quantum mechanics may bend to uh, aspects of general relativity. And I'll say more what I mean by this later. Now, our main tools for quantum gravity include the gravitational path integral and its Hamiltonian formulation in particular, as well as most notably string theory. Now these each produce states and transition amplitudes. That is to say that the gravitational path integral as well as string theory allows us to compute uh, uh, transition amplitudes between classes of states. Those are the basic objects which the theories produce. However, unitary is not guaranteed in the path integral, and as such, it must be checked. That is to say, if you write down a path integral, whether it's some gravity path integral in effective field theory, or whether it's a path integral that would arise in string theory, that unitarity is not something one can take for granted. You need to check that the amplitudes that you produce by such a path integral satisfy the constraints of unitarity. So you must check it. It is not guaranteed a priori. We can turn now to a second question. So note that there are initial conditions, classical initial conditions for the state of the universe, which you evolve, which if you evolve them forward in time, terminate in some kind of singular crunch. A question which has been asked for many years is, what is their fate in quantum gravity? So let me draw a cartoon. Suppose that we have some set of initial conditions, which I will label by a state I, and then we evolve the state forward in time, and then the space time terminates in some kind of crunch. If you will, you could also think about this backwards, that if you look at a terminal or final state of the universe, and you evolve it backwards, then maybe you end in some kind of big bang, singularity. So there have been different kinds of conceptual suggestions to uh, attempt to make sense of or accommodate for the presence of smooth initial data that will lead to a crunch in the context of cosmology. So one such suggestion is that maybe there are certain kinds of uh, pieces of initial data which lead to particularly singular crunches that for some reason we, we might think that certain singularities are worse than others. And as such, these initial conditions which would give rise to the crunch are somehow projected out of the bulk Hilbert space. They just don't exist in the bulk. One way of putting this is that maybe, for instance, um, that if we had a better understanding of bulk quantum gravity in the context of cosmology, that certain kinds of singularities are resolved by the effects of quantum gravity. And as such, truly singular configurations don't really make sense um, in the bulk. They, they are uh, replaced by something fuzzier. 
Another, however, one should note that th th these kind of smooth initial conditions should correspond to asymptotic states in a de Sitter S matrix. In particular, you can imagine that if you have some, uh, if, if you're very, at a very, very early time and you prepare some smooth initial data, you would, it seems perfectly reasonable to uh, propagate this forward in time, to evolve the system forward in time, um, because it, it won't be singular for, for, for a while. And then if it eventually it crunches, then you have to contend with what happens to the crunch, which happens at intermediate times. This is all to say that something which is singular at finite bulk times, in terms of asymptotic boundary conditions, might look very smooth and reasonable. So it doesn't a priori seem to preclude you from computing S matrix amplitudes in a path integral formalism, because the boundary conditions seem perfectly reasonable. So there's this tension between smooth kind of data at the asymptotic boundaries of the space time and potentially singular data uh, at, at finite times in the bulk. And we'll, we'll come back to this. I just kind of want to bring up uh, a panorama yeah. of uh, kind of questions that we're going to try to touch in a very concrete way. Was there a question? Uh, one, one, one short question is, so what do you mean by deciduous matrix here? Yeah, so what I mean is that, um, so let me give you the simplest possible setting, which is that you can consider global Sitter space, uh, which has two asymptotic boundaries, one in the far future and one in the far past. You can prepare some initial data. And uh, for example, uh, you know, what, what, what the metric looks like asymptotically, uh, maybe the state of matter fields. And then you can evolve this into the far future and provided that it doesn't, doesn't crunch, uh, it, you know, that um, which there are many, many initial pieces of initial data that will not crunch, it will bounce because uh, of the de Sitter throat and it will end up uh, with some configuration in the far future. And you can regard that as a kind of S matrix because it's a map from asymptotic states in the far past to asymptotic states in the far future, provided again that, that there isn't any crunch in the middle, which would preclude you from getting to the far future. Uh, is that... Uh, yeah, that but, uh, but the center is not globally hyperbolic, so you can... Uh, uh, so it's a little bit unclear no? that how... Uh, how to define, I mean, uh, just uh, with, I mean, the initial conditions by themselves will not give a unique future if you, unless you take some other data, even classical. No, that's not true. Uh, it, it, no, that's not true at all. Um, you can, uh, you, you can just evolve Einstein's equations if you, I mean, um, usually what we do, of course. Uh, in in, in what patch you can, in the patch of Sitter you can, you mean this? Uh, I you do, no, no, I'm not, I don't want to do it in a patch. I want to do it on global Sitter. I, I tell you what, what I, I prepare some initial uh, state on the uh, asymptotic, if a global decider it's a sphere, it's a sphere in the far past and you can propagate that forward in time and see what happens. Uh, there's nothing that stops you from doing that. Uh, what, what's, what's, the, what's the issue that you're concerned with? The Penrose diagram looks like a box. So there is this uh, part that, uh... Well, the box, I mean, the asymptotic boundaries are at the top and the bottom of the box, right? Yeah. So and look at this past light cone, it doesn't touch the, uh, the, 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 the far, far past. The past light cone of what? Of the future, of this huge asymptotic future. Uh, that's. I mean that's just not true. Well, I don't I don't know what you're saying. If you if you if you specify the entire initial data on the future, it prescribes exactly what happens in the past. You can you can just evolve it backwards. Yeah, but uh, only it will only cover a patch, so you have to. Well, you have to specify the entire state. Uh, you have to specify it everywhere. Typically, for this uh, case, you have to both specify for necessity to space both uh, specify both the infinite past and the infinite future in probability to have it. Uh, but anyway, I think you're probably talking of some patch of this. No, I'm talking about global to sitter. I, I, I mean, th this is just a fact about, you can just do this in classical general relativity if you want to do it at the classical level. There's no, I mean, it's, uh, how do I say? It depends what you specify in the far future and the far past. I mean, just like in anything, I mean, you can, you, you, you can specify, for example, certain fall offs of the field and also their derivatives. You can also try to do a problem where you specify, uh, you know, just some, you know, uh, for example, can, can uh, I just jump in really quickly and try to like understand what Ion is trying to ask? I think what Ion is saying is that for Desitter, 
your conformal diagram, like you said, is a is a is a box, right? And there is a singularity at one end and singularity on, on top. And then if you are an observer in any one side of the sitter, there's always a horizon that prevents anything in, in the other in the other bottom half from affecting you. Uh, and I think maybe what Jordan is saying is that no, you specify the state on the whole thing and you don't worry about which observer is where and you just let that state evolve. I, I don't right. think it makes any sense to either one of you. So. Yeah, no, that's that, that's exactly right. I mean, if you wanted to only work in the static patch, that would be a different story. Um, I mean, I guess what you can say, I mean, the thing you might be concerned about, let me maybe say it this way, is whether whether it's sort of physical. Yeah, I mean, a single observer, maybe this is the point that's confusing, cannot measure all of the data, for example, in the far future or far past, because, you know, you just... Uh, if you look at the world line of an observer, you really only have access to kind of a tiny region. Um, but that that's right, that's right. And but what you're saying is that you're just specifying the state on the entire. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you don't care which observer sees what. So but there is no Cauchy yeah. slice, right? Or Desitor, there is uh, global Desitor has no Cauchy slice. Sure, sure it does. It's a, it's a sphere. Ah, okay. The, no, but that is a Euclidean, of course. Uh, in no. But uh, no, no, no. The global desitter has Cauchy slices, which are spheres. Yeah, okay. Anyway, can we can continue this later? Yeah. Um. Okay. So let's 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 continue on. Um. So the um. Anyway, the uh. So so one proposed. So so going back to this picture about singularities, um, it seems that there are nice states. And the asymptotic Hilbert space that are very smooth, but that lead to behavior which crunches at finite times. So there have been some suggestions at a conceptual level that maybe the bulk Hilbert space is somehow different than the space of viable asymptotic states. This one way that this could make sense is if there are asymptotic states which somehow are projected out by the evolution uh, in, in the sitter, that somehow you take this, this nice smooth asymptotic data and upon evolving it forward in time, certain states just disappear. That's uh, That would be very strange, but that could reconcile why there is some potential difference between kind of nice asymptotic states and nice bulk states. They're sort of different. They're, they're, they're not one-to-one -one related to each other. So anyway, these are the two questions which we want to think about. And in order to do so, we need a framework for desitter quantum gravity. In other words, it's we can speculate about these questions uh, at a heuristic level, but we would like to have a concrete computational framework uh, for computing amplitudes not perturbatively in models of desitter quantum gravity so that we can see what may or may not happen with these questions in that context. So two simple models that we're going to focus on, which will allow us to realize uh, some of the puzzles that I have described is on the one hand, the sitter Jakeev type of one gravity, which will be the star of the show. This will be the main model that we will uh, consider. And then um, Einstein gravity with a positive cosmological constant and a mini superspace truncation. This is this should be regarded as just the second model is like a very toy version of a model of pure Einstein gravity. Uh, although I'll actually explain later if we can maybe talk about this during, during the discussion, that certain features of the analysis in Jakeev tidal bond gravity, in fact, have some uplifting, if you will, to pure Einstein gravity without making a mini superspace approximation. And I can talk about what we do understand and what we don't understand. So yeah. let me, yes, go ahead. I mean, um, okay, so please forgive me if my question is is, is too naive. Um, it, you know, I mean, you, you're looking at, at Desitter, Right, and is that the reason you're not looking at ADS is because in ADS you already have a well-defined ADS CFT correspondence, and in DS that's not the case. Well, the very simple reason I'm interested in Desitter is because we presumably live in some as a universe which is asymptotically Desitter, and uh, we don't understand how holography works really in the context of Desitter. So I view, and there are certain questions which arise. Um, about features of what the holographic dictionary is, how it should work, uh, that, that we would like to get a better, better, better handle on, and uh, that are particularly relevant to questions of cosmology. 
So I would say that's the motivation. The motivation is to take ideas from holography and try to describe them in contexts that are closer to the world. Right. And while I admit to the fact that G the Jakeev tidal bomb gravity is not the world, uh, it's I, I think that it, um, it it suggests features which I think will con continue to persist in uh, higher dimensional models of considered quantum gravity, and I can I can talk about that later. But, but but that's the motivation. The motivation is to try to connect holography to the world in in in, in a certain way, and to understand the kind of difficulties and in, in new phenomena which arise in attempting to do so. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, uh, thank. You. Yeah, but uh, I need to ask. just to continue. There, there is. Uh, I mean, just to uh, in context of Deepak's question, the, there's even in EDS you have some initial conditions which can branches. I think that also is. Uh, I mean, of course, in ADS, you, you have to also supplement by some uh, boundary conditions, but for any yeah. given boundary condition, there will be uh, initial conditions which crunches in ADS. So I can repeat the same uh, question there. Yeah, that's right. Um, we, we don't, uh, how do I say? Uh, I would say we don't really understand that either in the ADS context, but um, I think that we have. Uh, I can explain later, but the way in which this manifests in considered quantum gravity is sort of more severe in a certain sense than the way in which it manifests in ADS CFT. We'll have to get a little deeper into it for me to explain. But indeed, there are certain kinds of, uh, you know, there are circumstances in ADS which would involving singular geometries, which we also don't understand. Uh, I'm not claiming that we understand it there better. I just I just want to understand in the Desitter case in particular because, um, well. Again, the motivation is that we live ostensibly in a de Sitter type universe, asymptotically de Sitter, at least in the far future. Or if you will, you can think about de Sitter as sort of being, you know, you know, the, we, we, you, you roughly live in a kind of de Sitter region right after inflation ends. So you can think about it kind of as an approximate description of the early universe, or if you will, a very good description of the very late universe, whichever you like. And um, yeah, I'd like to understand singularities in the cosmological setting of de Sitter space. But, but indeed, I, I there are questions in ADS that I, I likewise do not know the answer to, but I will have nothing to say about them. I see. But maybe you're also going to comment on what are the observables of ES quantum gravity you have in mind, because this is one question that uh, in constructed de Sitter, uh, unlike in ADS safety, we have concrete observables, which... Uh, uh, yeah, what can um, I'll, I'll speak to this. And... Uh, if you feel, yeah, so feel free to ask again, maybe in a few minutes, yeah, if yeah. I, or maybe in 10 minutes, if I haven't sp uh, sp spoken about it in as, as explicit a way as you would, you would like. I'm happy to discuss that. Great. So so let me forecast the main results of the talk. So in the synergy of tidal bound gravity, evolution from the bulk to the infinite future, namely some bulk state evolved to the far future, is isometric not unitary. So let me say what I mean by isometric, because for those people who are maybe uh, inclined to think about general relativity, the word isometry means something slightly different in that context. I mean is isometric in the sense of Hilbert space, not in the sense of uh, physical space. But I'll say what that means. So let me draw a picture uh, so that we can unpack what this means. Suppose that we have global to center space and that we have a boundary in the asymptotically far past. So if you work in one plus one dimensions, the uh, the, the spatial slices of the sitter space are just circles. So this is the asymptotically far past, and this is the asymptotically far future. And we can have uh, a an S matrix or a, a transition amplitude, which maps us from states in the asymptotic far past to the asymptotic far future. Now we can break this up into two different uh, evolutions, you can break this up in an evolution from the uh, asymptotic Hilbert space to the bulk Hilbert space, if you will, or, you know, so, some states that you associate, for instance, with the bottleneck of the geometry, and then another map from the bulk Hilbert space to the asymptotic boundary. As we'll see later, we can think about these maps as being, as, as, as the full S matrix as being a composition of a map V dagger with a map V. And so V maps the bulk to the uh, asymptotic far future. And what's interesting is that this map V is not a unitary map. In particular, while V dagger V equals the identity, which is a feature that a unitary map also possesses, it is the case that if you compose V and V dagger in the other order, 
namely in this order, V and V dagger like this, this, which equals the S matrix, but it's not the identity, it's actually equal to a projector. So V is a map which in one direction of composition gives you the identity, and in the other direction of composition gives you a projector, which is not the identity. As such, V itself is not a unitary operator because one direction of its composition is a projector, not the identity operator. And as such, uh, so V is actually called an isometry. An operator with this property on Hilbert space is called an isometry. And we'll see that the reason, in fact, it's called an isometry is that you can think about the bulk to asymptotic map as mapping from a smaller Hilbert space, namely the bulk Hilbert space, as we'll see, into the larger Hilbert space, which is the asymptotic Hilbert space, in such a way that uh, it's, it's, it's an angle preserving embedding. It, it maps the small subspace into larger Hilbert, as a sub, it maps the small Hilbert space into a subspace of the larger Hilbert space in such a way that it preserves the, the, the Hilbert space inner product. The issue, of course, of go, is going backwards. If you take a larger Hilbert space, you have to uh, somehow squish it in a smaller Hilbert space, which is why you why it becomes uh, can, can I, why this direction gives you a projection. Yes. Jordan, is it okay if I interrupt you, or should I wait for a break? Yeah, yeah please. Yes. Um, so, I mean, when you say the the Hilbert space, uh, you're you're just talking about like the geometric degrees of freedom, right? You're talking about pure gravity. I'll, I'll, I'll define it very precisely what I mean by the Hilbert space. We'll spend quite a bit of time discussing it. Uh, so here, I, I, I haven't defined any of these objects or the Hilbert spaces yet, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but I will in great detail. And um, uh, But I just wanted to sort of give you the organization of what's what, what to expect to happen. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, so what we'll find in particular is that the bulk Hilbert space and the asymptotic Hilbert spaces are not equal to each other. In fact, there's a sense in which the bulk Hilbert space is much smaller than the asymptotic Hilbert space. So we will find that this follows from a sum over smooth metrics. In other words, this follows by doing a non-perturbative path integral computation, which you can do in GK Teitelbaum gravity. It's one of the luxuries that the theory provides us. And we'll also find some initial evidence that this picture uh, also is true in Einstein gravity in higher dimensions. I'll, I'll have more to say about this later. But this is just the schematic of what the results are going to look like. But we're, we'll unpack everything in great detail. So the talk will have three parts. Um, we'll have we'll discuss the synergy keep title bond gravity. That'll be most of the talk. I'll maybe if we have time make a few comments in part two on mini superspace uh, is, is sort of a, a point of departure to consider higher dimensional Einstein gravity. And then I'll conclude with a, a discussion about some conceptual remarks as well as some, some uh, ideas about generalizations. So let's begin with the main meat, De Sitter, Jacob, Feinblum gravity, and how it interfaces with the story which I explained so far. So this is a theory which has been uh, by now well studied. Some of the original papers on this theory uh, were from 2019 by uh, Maldasena, Teriyachi, Yang, as well as myself, Christian Jensen, Alex Maloney, with another follow-up by myself and Christian. So. Let me write down the action for Jakiv Tardub when gravity, which is, uh, here's the action. So let me unpack this for a moment. So we have our, an Euler characteristic term, which basically just comes from the integral over the, uh, over the Ricci scalar. Um, we have uh, this slightly unusual term. So what does this term do? Here we have a phi, a non-dynamical dilaton, because it has no kinetic terms, um, which serves as a Lagrange multiplier to enforce that the Ricci scalar uh, equals two. Okay, so um, this essentially enforces the constraint of constant positive curvature because we're working in the sitter space. And then this term here, you can think of as a Gibbons Hawking York boundary term um, with, with an appropriate counter term. Uh, so this is the theory. It's a it, it's sort of one of the simplest theories of quantum gravity in lower dimensions that still has relatively rich behavior. And let me just write down some of the solutions to the equations of motion that, that you get. So here are some global solutions. So here's the profile of the dilaton, and here's the metric. Let's look at the metric. So the metric has an angular variable x, which is periodically identified. And so we see here that the uh, 
that the warp factor shows us that we have exponential growth in the far future. So there's an exponential expansion of the space time as t goes to infinity, but there's also exponential expansion of the space as t goes to minus infinity. And uh, there's a parameter alpha squared, which is you can regard as a, as a modulus, which dictates the size of the bottleneck of the space time, particularly the circumference of the minimum geodesic uh, so it's a space like geodesic bottleneck is two pi times alpha. So if alpha is larger, then the space time is a bit fatter in the middle. So what's interesting about Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity, this is what I'm about to say is true both in the De Sitter and in the ADS case, is that it has no propagating degrees of freedom. Okay, well, that's that's just a feature of low dimensional gravity, but it still possesses, nonetheless, it possesses boundary gravitons, which are captured in the so-called Schwarzian mode. So you could, it has certain edge modes, which in De Sitter live in the far future and in the far past. You can think about them as fluctuations of, of the boundary. And, um, and it also possesses a non-trivial moduli space uh, of, of solutions. So even though it's low dimensional gravity, it still has enough richness that uh, the theory can provide us with some interesting insights. It's not a completely trivial theory, but nonetheless, it's one over which we can have non-perturbative control. So at, relevant for us is let's discuss for the moment, what are the boundary conditions for uh, Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity in De Sitter space in the far future and similarly in the far past, because we, we need to fix boundary conditions. Okay, so let's look at the far future. The, the boundary conditions in the far past are similar. Um, so the first thing that we do is that we want to have the space time be asymptotically De Sitter, meaning that as you go into the far future, that it looks like De Sitter space. So what that means is that after some appropriate change of coordinates, if you do some kind of Pfefferman Gram type expansion in the far future, you would like the metric to go to for large positive t to go as minus dt squared plus e to the 2t plus some order one subleading term times dx squared. So th these are the, you know, this is what it means to have asymptotically to sitter boundary conditions. And we also need to, in this theory, specify the behavior of the dilaton. The dilaton, recall, is the thing that serves as the Lagrange multiplier field. Well, you also want the dilaton to become exponentially large in the far future. Um, and uh, th this is so as to render the uh, the action of the theory finite for solutions to the equations of motion. And the thing that you that it turns out that the uh, that the, the 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 data of the boundary conditions that you fix, at least in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity, is specified by the profile of the dilaton. So in particular, the dilaton can have some um, can can have some uh, profile in the x direction. Um, in the far future, which is specified by this e to the phi of x. So these are the boundary conditions that you, that, that you fix in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity. And uh, the, way, uh, the way you should think about it is that the asymptotic states in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity are labeled by the profile of the dilaton. Uh, there are ways of sort of rearranging this into the metric degrees of freedom. Mean, there's different ways of sort of presenting the same data, but this will be a convenient way of packaging it for our purposes. So for those of you, for example, who have thought about Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity in but ADS, uh, yes. So these uh, graviton degrees of freedom, they're basically encoded in uh, the dependence of the dilaton on the boundary. The way I would say it, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say it in a slightly different way. I think the more precise way is that to say is that if you do this in higher dimensions, the degrees of freedom that are playing the role here of the dilaton will in higher dimension be packaged into the graviton or into the gravitational field. Here, there's sort of these two different fields. There's the metric and the dilaton, and they're kind of jointly playing a role, which is played by the gravitational field by itself in higher dimensions, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, I, I can, that can be made more, I can make that more precise, but, uh, but that's. Yeah, and, and one more, one more naive question. Uh, like the dilaton is supposed to be uh, not have any dynamics, right? It's a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, but uh, so when you say it doesn't have any dynamics, like should it depend on time? Like, or is that something oh. silly? Um, well, what I mean by what I mean by non-dynamical, one should be careful. What I mean by non-dynamical is simply that uh, there is no explicit kinetic term in the action. However, if you look at its equations of motion, it satisfies some kind of wave equation because uh, you know, when you vary, for example, the um, 
the metric degrees of freedom and integrate by parts, certain derivatives will fall on the Lagrange multiplier. But but it's at a, but so um, how do I say? I, all I mean is that it doesn't have a kinetic term in the action. But but the solutions to its equations of motion can be time dependent. Okay, thanks. Sure. So the asymptotic data is special. So oh right. So the thing I was going to say is that in anti de Sitter space. Uh, something you might be more familiar with if you thought about Jakeev Tidewheim gravity is that what you do is you specify the renormalized um, length, for example, in ADS of the boundary, call it beta or L or wh whatever you like. Uh, this is a more general version of this, really, because you can think about um, this function it's zero mode, or well, I'll, I'll be more precise about this in a moment, but it's zero mode is sort of related to the uh, to the renormalized length of the boundary. So usually in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity, what you do is that you only consider S wave boundary conditions for the, for the dilaton, that you, you, you force it to take a constant value in the far future as opposed to an arbitrary profile. Here we're doing something a bit more general. Okay, that's just a technical aside. So in any case, in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity, you can a, a useful object is to compute the amplitude from the bottleneck to the far future. So you can think about that as a kind of transition amplitude from the bottleneck to the far future, which is sort of the building block of computing the full Eskimos matrix amplitude. So if you have a, you know, alpha and then phi, phi is labels the profile of the dilaton, there's a certain path integral that you perform over these Schwarzian degrees of freedoms over these, uh, these large uh, these large gauge transformations or boundary gravitons, whatever you want to call them, which computes the amplitude from alpha squared to, uh, sorry, for, from this slice here to, to this slice. We'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, let me maybe not say anything further about this at the moment. These are just, this is, these are just about the Schwarzian degrees of freedom. The important thing is that you can compute this amplitude. Uh, actually, it's one loop exact um, in Jakeev Teitelbaum gravity in a sitter space. Okay, so so here's the amplitude again. It's the amplitude from from here to to, to the top. Um, and then what you can do is that if you want to compute the full S matrix amplitude, you can prepare some uh, an, um, some initial state where you have a different dilaton profile in the far past, and you have a different dilaton profile. So, so you have e to the phi tilde in the far past and e to the phi in the far future, and you can compute the transition amplitude to go from this state in the far past. To, to the other state in the far future. <clears throat> and schematically, what you do is that you take this uh, amplitude from alpha squared to start from the bottleneck to the far future. You take another one um, from the far past to alpha squared. You glue them together at the bottleneck, and then you integrate over all values of the, of the, of the, the bottleneck parameter. Uh, and you have to be very careful about the treatment of the measure. That's schematically what you do. Okay, so to proceed, uh, we'll talk about these things again in so greater detail. The, uh, but, yeah. At the at the bottleneck, the only parameter you have is alpha. Is there no corresponding uh, profile of the dilaton like at the infinite past? The, uh, the, there is, but um, you can fully package the, the sort of only uh, modulus that you need to integrate over in the path integral. Or how do I say? You, you can oh, think yeah. about alpha. Right. alpha yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. We'll, we'll, we'll understand this later why that's the case. Yeah. So in other words, the thing you might be concerned about, let, let me let me maybe unpack it because there is something going on here that you observed. It seems funny that you specify an entire function of X up here. And here there's just a constant that specifies what the data is here. That's There seems like a huge mismatch. It turns out that in fact, as we'll see in a moment, that the, the, uh, that this Hilbert space is smaller it actually is more like specify. It turns out that the only thing that really matters in the far future, you'll we'll understand this in about five minutes, is 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 the zero mode, roughly speaking, of this function of e to the phi. So even if you specify a whole function, it turns out that there's a bunch of null states, and that it's only basically boils down to specifying a constant. Okay, but anyway, that's not going to be comprehensible at the moment. Let's wait five minutes, and you'll. We'll resolve some of this tension in a moment once we unpack in more detail what the Hilbert spaces are. So with that in mind, um, well, uh, we, there's four different objects that we need to kind of complete our story. We need to define the asymptotic Hilbert space, or, or what are the asymptotic Hilbert spaces? And we need to say, what is the de Sitter S matrix? Uh, we need to define the bulk Hilbert space, and we also need to define the bulk to asymptotic map. 
And then we need to put these together in such a way as to figure out what's going on with our story. So one of the reasons why we need to specify the asymptotic Hilbert spaces is that we don't just need to know the states, but we need to know the inner products on the Hilbert spaces. Well, one reason why we need to know the inner products is because um, that uh, when we, we need to know them because if we want to assess the unitarity of the S matrix, then we need to be able to uh, know that the states that we're computing in the transition amplitudes are properly normalized. In other words, if I gave you just a bunch of matrix elements and I didn't tell you how the states were normalized, you wouldn't be able to assess whether the S matrix is unitary. You need to know what the normalization is of, of, of the states that are appearing in the transition amplitudes or otherwise you have no means by which to assess unitarity. Um, okay, so we need, among other things, the inner product on, uh, on asymptotic, I'm oh, sorry, on, on, the, on each Hilbert space, the asymptotic one and the bulk one. So let's start with the asymptotic Hilbert space. Jordan, uh, oh. just uh, one, one question that uh, can I ask uh, this uh, with yes, the picture that was drew uh, for the Desiter, the global Desiter. I mean, it's a weak rotated version of this uh, uh, two sided ADS, right? I mean, global ADS2. It's a weak rotated version in the sense that you have these two asymptotic boundaries and uh, and they have to be connected at this uh, Einstein Rosen bridge. And it's basically the Einstein Rosen bridge connecting these two. Uh, this thing at uh, well, I mean, how do I say the uh, well, not exactly, of course, because I mean, well, maybe right, like, the difference. And... Well, maybe you're thinking that it sort of looks like, I guess, a global slice of ADS or sorry, a space like slice of ADS3, possibly. You mean, uh, no, 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 not ADS3 uh, slice. I was thinking uh, if you if for ADS2 itself. You can, uh, you can kind of, well, a uh, slice of ADS2 is, is, is one dimensional, not two dimensional. <laughs> this is a two dimensional thing. Ah, okay. So, uh, right. So, okay. So, yes, uh, this looks more like a slice of ADS3 rather than, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course, it, the boundary conditions are quite different, but um, anyway. Uh, okay, so but uh, this there is no uh, there is no version of it uh, in ADS that you can uh, can define. Well, the closest problem. analog to ADS would be to look at Euclidean ADS. Euclidean, and then, and, okay, but and, and then to look at wormholes in Euclidean ADS. Hmm. Yeah, it's ADS more like, uh, right, right. This is not uh, yeah because you have a circle rather than a. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, there's there's all there's a whole story, of course, about wormholes in Euclidean ADS too, and and indeed this the, there there is some connection, although the fact that this is in Lorenzian signature actually gives it rather different features, which is related to comp the computation of amplitudes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about the asymptotic Hilbert space. So our period of Hilbert space in the far future is the span of these states um, e to the phi of x. That's what we, you know, that's what we wrote down. But let's try to compute what is the inner product on these states. It's because we, we wrote the states down, but we don't know what their inner product is. So, so let me first give you a cartoon that will motivate how the calculation works. So, okay, so suppose that we prepare the final state that we're interested in. So we want to look at the inner product, for example, between e to the phi one and e to the phi two. We want to look at their inner product against each other. Okay, so how should we do this? Well, the basic picture is that in the far future, you prepare the final boundary conditions e to the phi one. And then on a slice that's a little bit further in the past, you prepare the boundary conditions e to the phi two on some Cauchy slice. And then the idea is to perform the path integral where you simultaneously do two things. One is that you take both of the slices into the far future, into the asymptotic future. You take T2 infinity, and you also take the, the two slices to coincide. In other words, you take them to the future as you also take the limit that they become coincident. So that will then give you the inner product between the two states in the far future. As they become coincident, that gives you the inner product. As you take them into the far future, that gives you uh, the inner product in the asymptotic Hilbert space in particular. So to understand what's going on, the metric in the far future, if you expand it at large t, it looks like minus dt squared plus e to the 2t plus a subleading order one piece. Um, this is just the expansion here I've done of the global sitter metric. But in general, this is just some order one constant. It, it doesn't have a particular sign. And the idea is that whatever this number is, 
uh, you should integrate over all values of that number. It, it can be positive or negative because when t is very, very large, this term becomes goes towards positive infinity, and there's no res restriction actually on the uh, the subleading uh, on, on the subleading modulus that that shows up in the metric. So as t goes to infinity, the sign of this subleading order one piece becomes unrestricted. Um, in the strict t goes to infinity limit. And the inner product then is given by essentially gluing together these trumpets that I described before, where you integrate over all alpha squared. I can explain in more detail what this is, but it'll be illuminating to look at what the answer is and to understand the answer that you get. So you can perform this. This is the answer that you find. So let me define what these different things are. Let's define the inverse of phi, by which I just mean one over big phi, is being the integral one over two pi of zero to two pi dx of e to the minus phi. So you can think about this big phi as a zero mode that uh, of, uh, I'll, I'll refer to it as a zero mode of this, uh, of the configuration of our dilaton on the boundary. Moreover, S of phi is a certain functional of the dilaton profile phi. Okay. So this is the inner product that you get. Uh, it's sort of funny. I mean, it, it looks sort of like it's delta function localized in the zero modes, but there's these funny factor, there's these funny phase factors. So what's what's actually going on here? So it turns out that this inner product has null states. So in particular, if you look at states of the form e to the i s phi one times e to the phi minus e to the i s phi two times e to the phi, such that little phi one and little phi two have the same zero modes, these will be null states with respect to this inner product. Namely, they're, they're, the inner product of this state with itself will be equal to zero. So what this means, what, what, what you do, of course, in quantum mechanics, when you have a Hilbert space that has null states, is that the physical states are the whole set of states quotiented out by the null states. As such, this tells us that we should identify a, a, uh, an asymptotic state e to the phi with its zero mode. Okay, that, that there's an equivalence class, in other words, of all of these e to the phi's, which are labeled by their zero mode. And as such, the asymptotic Hilbert space is the span of these big phi's for all real values of big phi. And as such, this is isomorphic to L2 of R. So in particular, um, what, what happens is that these phi's will be, the, 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 these, Phase factors will no longer arise when, once we look at the uh, uh, once we quotient out by the null states, and the inner product will just look at something like will 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 just be like um, screwed phi one phi two times delta phi one minus phi two. I'll, I'll write this formula in a moment. But there's something physical going on here, which is that there's a physical reason for the null states, which is that there's a diff s one family of large diffeomorphisms which preserve the asymptotic metric but do not preserve the dilaton. So as such, there is a, uh, a diffeomorphism that you can perform, which preserves the asymptotic boundary conditions of the metric, but which changes the dilaton profile. And this set of, uh, of, of diffeomorphisms um, happens to preserve the zero mode. So what you would expect then, by virtue of gauge invariance, is that gauge invariance would mandate that two asymptotic states should be identified with one another if they share the same zero mode. And in fact, this expectation due to diffeomorphism invariance is realized um, by the computation that we did, or it's corroborated by that computation. And indeed, the asset of the Hilbert space of asymptotic states is labeled by these zero modes. It turns out that these zero modes you can associate with the renormalized length of the asymptotic boundary. So in, in summary, the asymptotic Hilbert space that we've derived so far is the span of these phi states and is like a, an L2, L2 of R is a Hilbert space, where the inner product between a state phi 1 and phi 2 is given by square root phi 1 phi 2 times delta of phi 1 minus phi 2. So it'll be convenient for later purposes to rescale phi by a state phi by dividing by this 1 over root phi. That will strip off these square root terms. Uh, so that will just give us an ordinary uh, delta function uh, inner product. So, so these are like in you know quantum mechanics of a single particle. These are like uh, uh, th these are like states in the X basis, if you will. Great. So that's the asymptotic Hilbert space. So now let's discuss the de Sitter S matrix. 
So let's compute S matrix elements. So we want to go from a state phi two in the far past to a state phi one in the far future. And okay, so we can compute this amplitude. And when we do it, this is the answer that we find. So this is the amplitude to go from a state phi two in the far past to a state phi one in the far future. And uh, okay, well, what's interesting is that this looks like a propagator of sorts. We see that it's it has a pull when phi one equals phi two. That that makes sense because uh, the on shell configurations are precisely those for which phi one equals phi two. So that that checks out. But it turns out that to understand what this amplitude means, it's convenient to work in kind of a, a momentum space picture. If we if we look at a conjugate basis to phi, if we look at like a p basis, which is like the momentum conjugate to phi, then uh, we can rewrite this as this is just the Fourier representation of the heavy side step function. So what you find is that in this momentum basis, the S matrix amplitude is a step function in P. So what does it do? It tells you that um, it projects out those initial states which have negative momentum, okay? So this shows, in fact, that the, the, the S matrix is not, in fact, a unitary, it's a projector. It, it, if you have a state in the far past which corresponds to negative P, it gets killed, it gets projected out of the spectrum. It does not survive into the future. That is that its transition amplitude is equal to zero by virtue of the step function. We'll understand in a moment why this is the case, but this is an interesting fact. Uh, again, it's, it's the fact that in this theory, when you do the computation and you're careful about the norm on, on asymptotic states, you find that the S matrix is not unitary. Okay, uh, but, but, but it, it's sort of, it's a very simple thing in this theory. It's just a projector. So you can think about it as being unitary in some subspace, but, but it's not unitary on the entire uh, asymptotic Hilbert space. That is to say that there are certain nice kind of final states, which you can prepare in the theory or initial states, which do not survive into the bulk upon performing S, uh, evolution by the S matrix. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, but <clears throat> I mean, could one say that maybe there are some features of this theory in particular, which uh, lead to this uh, non-unitarity, which, which yeah, might not so, be? Well, okay. It turns out that there's a physical reason for it that we'll see in a moment uh, that uh, will also be true in higher dimensions. So uh, so there is a physical picture as to why this is happening. It's, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, a, an oddity of the, um, it's a mathematical artifact of the strangeness of the theory. There's like a physical reason. And the physical reason I think is kind of compelling, but we'll, but, but I'll talk about that. We need a few more ingredients to sort of put the story together. But yeah, so I'll get that maybe in five minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Great, okay. So we have, okay, it's not unitary. So we have two ingredients so far. Let me rewrite the asymptotic Hilbert space in the P basis. So now everything is sort of commensurate. They're all on kind of the same terms. We have our asymptotic Hilbert space and we have our S matrix. So to understand what's going on, we would like to have a better understanding of what's going on in the bulk, as well as what's going on with this bulk to asymptotic map. So let's talk about the bulk Hilbert space. So a bulk analysis is going to help explain the presence of this projector, namely why we get a non-unitary uh, S matrix. So one way to sort of see what's going on is that it's convenient to gauge fix the metric in some kind of temporal gauge where we just have a warp factor uh, in front of the uh, dx squared term. And then using this, you can write the bulk part of the JT action uh, in terms of this Q and P variable, where Q is equal to the dilaton over A dot, and P is equal to A squared minus A dot squared. So you see that in these variables with this gauge fixing, what you get is just a very simple action, Q times P dot, or if you integrate by parts, PQ dot, it looks like, uh, uh, a, a theory with um, uh, it, in the phase space path integral, because there's just a PQ dot or a QP dot term with a zero Hamiltonian. There's no Hamiltonian. Um, because usually in the phase space path integral, you expect to get a, uh, something that's like PQ dot minus H, where H is the Hamiltonian. Here, there's only a P and a Q dot term or a Q and a P dot term, and the Hamiltonian is equal to zero. And in fact, this is what you expect in gravity. There's a certain sense in which the Hamiltonian is equal to zero in Einstein gravity. So there are two natural options for boundary conditions. 
The first is that as Q, uh, you can fix Q as T goes to infinity, preparing states like Q of X. This is the same, it turns out, as fixing the profile of the diloton. The other natural set of boundary conditions is to fix P as T goes to infinity, uh, which prepares states labeled by P of X. Let's opt for the second of these two options. Either one will do, but let's it'll look simpler if we do it uh, by fixing the P states. So the putative bull Hilbert space then is the span of these states P of X. So it turns out that if you rewrite P and if you reconstruct it in terms of the warp factor A, it's equal to A squared minus A dot squared. And the non-singularity of the bulk geometry requires these C plus and C minus factors to be non-zero. So this is for solutions to the uh, equations of, of, uh, of, of motion. So let me be more clear about this. Uh, so let me just mention a few quick facts. It turns out that P of X can be straightened out to large diffeomorphism so that um, we can identify all of these profiles uh, of P of X to, uh, there's also null states in this Hilbert space. There's a similar story as before. We can uh, have an equivalence class of these states that are labeled by constant values of P. And we would like to then know which values of this P are allowed. So it turns out that if you rewrite the, uh, the bulk metric in terms of P, you find that if P is greater than zero, then this corresponds to uh, just a bouncing cosmology where you have global de Sitter space and the circumference is related to P. If P is less than zero, then the metrics that you get are these crunch geometries that at T equals zero, the, the, uh, the, the, the circle shrinks to zero size and actually has a cone point. So in other words, if, P, if you have states where P is greater than zero, you get a bouncing cosmology. And if P is less than zero, you get a crunch cosmology where, it, where, you, where you shrink down to a cone point. So it turns out that these crunch geometries are not actually solutions to the uh, equations of motion of just de Sitter JT gravity because the cone point um, leads to a violation of the equations of motion. So the only ones which actually are solutions to the theory or which we really moreover integrate over in the path integral correspond to the bounce cosmologies, meaning that we should restrict that, that we should associate P with the size of the bottleneck alpha squared for the, for the bouncing geometries. So in, in sum total, this means that the bulk Hilbert space is labeled by these states P for P greater than zero, which also have an L2 inner product. So we should think about the bulk Hilbert space as being labeled by these states that correspond to the circumference of the bottleneck in a bouncing geometry cosmology. But the bounce, um, how do I say? But the circumference uh, is always uh, positive. It's always a positive number. So that's, so, so, so this is the bulk Hilbert space. It's, so it, it labels the space of bouncing solutions, not crunching solutions. Um, Jordan, can I ask this question? Uh, if I ask a question here. Yes. Uh, so if I want to understand this thing in a classical saddle point point of view, so you have two independent uh, kind of diffeomorphisms in the far future and far past, which are residual, uh, and you would like to somehow smoothly glue them uh, at this bottleneck. Yes. And, uh, um, and could you understand this, that there is some smoothness conditions are violated if, uh, I mean, if there is some kind of more of a saddle point like picture here that you could present? Well, uh, how do I say? So the point is that for certain, okay, so the picture is this. For certain initial and final data, um, what you will get, so I, I'll say what the classical picture is, although JT gravity allows us to look at off shell things as well, but let me, just, the classical picture is just easier to say in words, which is that there are certain initial and final conditions of the classical theory, which will lead to uh, a, uh, a smooth geometry in the middle, which will be a bouncing cosmology. Okay. And uh, however, there are also smooth initial and final conditions, which will lead to a crunch cosmology. And at the crunch, it'll actually, at the, at the cone point induced by the crunch, it will actually violate the bulk equations of motion. So it's not actually a classical solution. 
So there so will be some kind of uh, 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 some first derivatives or something you cannot match or some. Uh, uh, there will be yeah, some I mean, uh, essentially, there's a delta function of singularity in the curvature. Hmm. That's one way to look at it. Um, that's right. So, yeah. Uh, well, let me maybe finish this one particular part of it. So, so P is greater than zero due to the restriction of smooth geometries. And uh, the evolution of the bulk is trivial. This, this, this quantum number, this P is conserved. So at finite bulk times, uh, the, the, the evolution basically is just, just conserves this quantity. The evolution is trivial, just the identity. Okay, so, so, so here's our picture so far. And we need one last piece of the story before we can tie everything together. Which is the bulk to asymptotic map, and then I will summarize. Okay, can I uh, can I ask a yeah. little bit on, on this question? So, if there is some kind of localization in this uh, path integral, so you would uh, uh, essentially uh, the localization would say that if you can uh, uh, just uh, think in terms of this smooth diffeomorphisms, you now this uh, this large diffeomorphisms how they can be viewed, uh, and uh, so it should be enough to just look into this uh, picture. Of uh, yeah. this way of looking at it, if you can smoothly take diffeomorphisms and, uh, through the bottleneck, that should also already also reproduce this. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. No, I'm just saying that in the context of uh, in the Euclidean context, we know that uh, this uh, there is this localization of path yes. integral, yeah, to this uh, to this, uh, uh, this modulized space of uh, this is what is called this. Uh, yeah. While Peterson, yeah, yeah, while Peterson, yeah, uh, yeah. So this, uh, so there, if there's a similar, similar thing here, then we would just can just look into the smoothness of diffeomorphisms, whether we can just and yeah. construct this from this, whether you can smoothly uh, glue the diffeomorphisms in the far past and far future, right? Yeah, I mean, um, how do I say? I mean, the, the, the point is that the localization sort of only really works. For the non-singular solutions, I mean, the, sorry, the, kind of these singular geometry. If you integrate only over smooth geometries in the path integral, which are, you know, which uh, then uh, uh, then you're, how do I say? Um, the, the point essentially is that these uh, these singular geometries are not in the the contour of path integration. I don't even think we really know how to make sense of them in that context because they would have uh, they would have kind of infinite actions. Because oh. they sort of maximally violate the equations of motion, like it's like their their violation is sort of singularly infinite. <laughs> so you know the, the path integral is sort of really rapidly oscillating, kind of infinitely, kind of around there. If it was Euclidean theory, you would just be the contribution would be zero, but. It's sort of Lorenzian, so it's sort of like a stationary phase type thing. Yeah. Anyway, the non-trivial point is that you get uh, isometry. You could get some uh, kind of a meaningful. Uh, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Case. So that's so indeed. So so that's the last piece of this, which is the bulk to asymptotic map, um, which is uh, this map from the, the bottleneck to the far future. When you, what it does is it relates these this big P. Um, which is how we were labeling states in the bulk to these little p's on the boundary. And what 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 the map does is it tells you that if your p, uh, how do I say, it maps so so these p's are positive and it maps these p's to these p's sort of it canonically identifies them. But what the map does is that it, if you have a p that's negative in the far future and you try to evolve it backwards with v dagger, it, it projects it out. So in other words, it basically says that these this this which is always positive is identified with the positive p here, but if you have a negative p here, it's not identified with anything down here because these have to be positive. So this p, when you evolve it backwards, if this is negative, it gets projected out. So this means that v dagger v, if if you evolve forward and then back, you get the identity on the bulk Hilbert space. But if you start in the future and you evolve back and forward, you get a projector onto positive little piece. Because when you evolve back, you're projecting out all the negative piece, because those are the ones that would lead to crunches. So the bulk to asymptotic map is an isometry. And then that kind of completes the ingredients. So now let's put them all together. I'll just say what the words are. So the bulk to asymptotic Hilbert spaces are unequal to one another. 
the bulk Hilbert spaces are sort of these positive P's and the asymptotic Hilbert spaces can be any P. But the, the De Sitter JTS matrix is not unitary. It's a projector onto positive P states. And in a certain sense, this is what reconciles the, the difference between the bulk and asymptotic Hilbert spaces. It's what allows them to be different is because the, this sort of tension between their difference is resolved by the fact that the, map, the natural maps between them instantiated by evolution uh, are not unitary, but isometric. Moreover, we have unitarity within a code subspace of non-crunching states. Namely, if you restrict to so just states with positive P, then everything looks perfectly unitary. Um, and the bulk to boundary map, interestingly, as I said, is an isometry as opposed to being a unitary map. So let me make a few comments and then maybe I will jump ahead and conclude in the interest of time, but let me just make a few quick comments. The first is about the hartle hawking state. So if you look at the hartle hawking state, for example, in this theory, um, so this is, I, I didn't talk about this before, but you can prepare a Euclidean cap and then evolve it in Lorenzian time into the far future. So in De Sitter JT gravity, you can think about this as preparing Euclidean cap state and then evolving it with the isometry into the far future. And this is what's called the hartle hawking state. But if you act with V dagger on the hartle hawking state, you just get the cap state, which is some state in the bulk. So let me draw it. This is the cap state. And what you find in the P basis is that the cap state is equal to delta prime of P minus one. So it's, it's, it's a state which has divergent norm. So this tells you, in fact, that the hartle hawking state in Jaki of to M gravity, in fact, uh, is not normalizable, which was actually already known, but this is a very kind of clean way of seeing it. The hartle hawking state in JT gravity, again, is not a normalizable state. Okay. The other comment I want to make is that if you look at the hartle hawking state more generally, let's suppose that you take the hartle hawking state in, in, say, even in higher dimensions, if this story makes sense, and you look at its inner product with itself. Okay. What do you expect to find? Well, if you look at the inner part of the hartle hawking state in itself, well, it's the cap state. There's a V dagger V, and then there's a cap state again. But V dagger V is the identity. So this is just the cap state with the cap state. So if we look at what happens with the picture, the Vs will cancel out, and you'll just get, pictorially, a sphere. So what you might expect is that this, the, the, the norm of the hartle hawking state, when done with, with being very careful about the norm, would give you the sphere partition function, the Euclidean sphere partition function. So we're currently actually testing if this works to one loop in three plus one dimensional Einstein gravity. So let me make one other comment, which is that you may know that uh, Jakiv Teitelbaum gravity in ADS has a matrix integral description. In fact, uh, there's a different matrix integral description, which you can, which is true for, it's actually a different matrix model. There's a different one that you can do for uh, the sitter space. And, Without saying too much words about it in the interest of time, I just want to point out that the matrix model also knows about this uh, projector. That th th there is a certain quantity in the matrix model involving these what are called half resolvents. The details aren't so important for the conceptual point. Point is that the matrix model knows about this violation of unitarity. It's something that is baked, that is sort of universal in the matrix model, uh, and it knows something about this isometry property, which is quite quite interesting. The reason that it's interesting the matrix model knows about is that a matrix model has no space and no time, right? Uh, it's just a bunch of matrices. There's no notion of Lorenzian time. There's a, but so somehow with this zero plus zero dimensional theory of just these statistical integrals over matrices, it somehow knows something about this Lorenzian theory of de Sitter quantum gravity. And it knows in particular something about the isometric nature of the evolution. I find that extremely interesting. And there's more to say about that. So let me, um, I'm going to jump ahead actually in the interest of time to the this mini superspace thing, I can summarize it later. But in the interest of time, since we had questions, I think it would be more suitable to uh, have some kind of uh, set, set up some discussion. So let me just terminate with a discussion here. Um, so the S matrix need not be unitary in quantum gravity. And the bulk and asymptotic Hilbert spaces need not match. Namely, crunching initial conditions can live in an asymptotic Hilbert space, but not in the so-called code subspace of bulk states. Com so this means that complete knowledge of bulk physics, even on arbitrarily large timescales, is not enough to deduce the De Sitter S matrix. P pretty interesting. 
So in our examples, evolution is trivial from the code subspace, and the breakdown of unitarity is invisible in perturbation theory and only arises non-perturbatively, at least in the JT models. And there's even inklings that this is also the case in higher dimensional gravity. So let me conclude with some comments and speculations. Let me just put them all on the table. Um, here we go. So one question is that, do these lessons work in higher dimensional gravity? It's, there's some preliminary evidence that would suggest that some version of what I said also makes sense in higher dimensions. A conceptual question you might ask is, is the restriction to a sum over smooth geometries uh, realized in UV completions of de Sitter quantum gravity, such as string theory? So for instance, maybe certain singular metrics that are sensible in string theory ought to be included in the low energy theory. So at a very high level, I think what's going on is that what that there are certain kinds of brain-like objects in string theory that would provide kind of viable uh, singular configurations on which space-time can end in, or space-time can begin would, would provide kind of viable kind of initial states of a big bang or a crunch. But the point is that there, there's still sort of a, a swampland, okay, that word might be overused, but there's still a vast number of states in the Hilbert space, even in string theory, which appear to make sense in the asymptotic S matrix, which would still be projected out. So e although there might be certain kinds of states that would lead to kind of the right kinds of um, initial conditions that could be sourced by kind of some kind of brain, I still think that most of the, uh, uh, of the final or initial states in the S matrix, even in a string theory picture, would actually correspond to something which at finite times would be projected out of the bulk Hilbert space. Um, okay, so the last comments is that we expect that the true Hilbert space of Sitter quantum gravity should be drastically smaller than indicated by its semi-classical description. In particular, holographic arguments suggested, at least in higher dimensional gravity, that the dimension of the Hilbert space is non-perturbatively finite and is dictated by the uh, by the uh, the horizon entropy in the sitter space by, by the by the Gibbons Hawking entropy of the cosmological horizon. So I think that our findings are a first step in this direction, where we can already see the pruning of bulk Hilbert space and the low energy effective description. That is, we've seen that there's a pruning of the bulk Hilbert space from a larger one. The naively infinite one, which would be indicated by the asymptotic Hilbert space, to something which, from the point of view of the bulk Hilbert space, is actually a lot smaller. So we can already see some of this pruning of the Hilbert space from a naively infinite dimensional Hilbert space to one that is that is much smaller. And and maybe with that, um, let me conclude, and I'm happy to answer any further questions or or comments uh, that, that you may have. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Wonderful talk. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. Yes, Pavan. Yes. Uh, so, so when you said uh, all the, uh, so when you were considering the data at the boundary, you said uh, all the states with the same zero mode are identified, and then you uh, calculate the uh, trans uh, transition amplitude between them. So, yes. it, it, this is a uh, this is very different from the picture in asymptotically flat space, right? Where large scale transformations lead to inequivalent states, and uh, you you're not. Uh, I mean, mm. uh, so where is this difference coming from? Right. So the uh, so here's how you should think about it. So usually, what we do is that. Um, Okay, so let, let, let me think about how to explain this, because the analogy, it, there's something funny going on in JT gravity, which is not really there in higher dimensions, or like, which, uh, it's a reorganization of the data in higher dimensions. So, so, so let me say it like this. In higher dimensions, the thing that you, uh, that you usually do is that you fix um, the, uh, the leading behavior of the metric at infinity, spatial infinity in the case of ADS, temporal infinity in the case of DS, or even null infinity, or it's more complicated in flat space. And then you let the subleading the subleading parts of the metric fluctuate. Those are the things that you integrate over in the path integral. So uh, 
basically, it, it turns out though that, um, how do I say, that what's going on here is that the, yeah, so what's going on here essentially is that uh, there is, in this theory, there is some asymptotic data which uh, of the dilaton, which um, is sort of like, um, how do I say, which when, there's a diffeomorphism that preserves the form of the asymptotic metric, namely it preserves the boundary conditions, but, but it doesn't actually preserve all of the data of the dilaton profile, it only preserves the zero mode. As such, kind of the only kind of gauge invariant um, notion of uh, uh, the, um, of, of the zero mode, for example, is it, sorry, of the dilaton, is it zero mode? So, sorry, let me give you a better, I realized a better analogy. If you, if you look at, for example, ADS, for example, and you look at what the asymptotic boundary conditions are, there is a, um, there, you can do, they're defined up to kind of a conformal symmetry, for example, right? So you can do a conformal transformation. It'll still correspond to the same boundary conditions in a Pfefferman gram expansion. So what you should do is you should, identify all of the final boundary conditions that are related up to a conformal transformation, for example. Maybe that's a better analogy, uh, is that you look at what transformations preserve the, the actual geometry of the boundary conditions, and you identify all boundary conditions which are related by, uh, basically, by diffeomorphisms that, that, that are just sort of spurious because they preserve the geometry. D does that make sense? Like it's just that in ADS, for example, because it's a conformal boundary, if you had different boundary conditions that are related by conformal transformation, then they're 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 actually they, they correspond to the same bulk space time. They're not different from each other. It's, it's just an ambiguity. It's just a, a redundancy in your description of the boundary conditions. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I have a question about this. Uh, uh... Hartle Hawking like state. Uh, suppose I, uh, is there a way to prepare uh, by using Euclid by inserting some operators or some other things I can do uh, in a way that I can create a finite, uh, something that has, uh, I mean, can you prepare a state by using Euclidean path integral uh, in a way that uh, you produce a finite norm state? Great, great question. So, um, so let me, there's two different, ways that you could attempt to answer this. Maybe I'll stop sharing the screen so we can all see each other. So um, the first way you could think about this is you could ask if the hartle Hawking state in higher dimensions uh, has a finite inner product, just the hartle Hawking state itself. Okay. And, and that may be true, in fact, in two plus one dimensions, I mean, we're still working it out, it appears to be true. In higher dimensions, you have to be careful about regular, well, we'll see. We're trying to understand what's going on there. It's not true in one plus one in JT. It seems that it's true in two plus one and three plus one and higher. This it's not clear. But I think you're also maybe asking a different question, which is: Are there alternatives to the hartle hawking Euclidean cap that you can prepare by, say, putting in some operators that would end up giving you something which is uh, has a finite norm? That seems very interesting. Uh, I don't fully know how to do that in a gauge invariant. Like, I, I actually don't know fully how to do that calculation. I think the reason it would be interesting to do such a thing, I think I know some versions of this in lower in low dimensional gravity where you can put in defect operators of certain kinds. But um, the basic issue is that um, uh, how do I say? The reason it would be interesting to do this thing is because it would give you other viable initial states that would not be the hartle hawking state, other initial states of the universe that you could study and then understand their implications for cosmology. It's just quite difficult to actually do the computations in practice and to do them in a way that you can guarantee that the amplitudes you get at the end of the day are, are, are diffeomorphism invariant. It's actually very subtle. Um, so uh, I think that would be a very interesting thing to think about. I just, I, it's just very, it's just quite hard. Um, so that's maybe the answer for now is that I, I don't know, <laughs> but it, it is an interesting question. Okay, so suppose if you have such a thing practically for, 
uh, for the case of uh, suppose what is the implication for say cosmological correlations if you have uh, if evolution is an isometry and not a, so I'm saying that perturbative we know how to do perturbative inflation for example right I mean inflation or cosmological perturbation so if now they are saying there is some non perturbative there is a huge effect and uh, so and this uh, you modeled so is there a way it affects standard inflationary computations for example or well uh that's a great question so i think um so i don't i don't know yet exactly we're still trying to understand what features of this story make sense in say four dimensional gravity and how to do these computations and of course in four dimensional gravity it's a little tricky because you have to do everything you know in order to make sure that you can really do this in the path integral you have to make sure that all the calculations that you're doing sort of satisfy the assumptions of effective field theory because uh in jt whether we know how to make sense of bottlenecks that are arbitrarily small because roughly speaking there's no issue it's constant cur it's not like the curvature is blowing up because it's constant curvature and like low dimensional gravity is funny because there's there's not like casmere energy there's a lot of things that simplify that allow you to do non-perturbative computations that that are just not true once you're in three plus one dimensions so you have to explore these things in more indirect ways but the thing that i think that i think that it would ultimately help with or the direction that i'm trying to pursue with it anyway is actually along the lines of the previous question that you asked which is that do these considerations inform us what other viable initial states there are uh in the path integral for uh, that are not the hartle hawking state because whenever you do inflationary cosmology you always in one way or another use the hartle hawking state <laughs> and uh there i don't see any reason why i mean it's a very nice state but uh Presumably, there are many other viable kinds of initial states of the universe, which would give you different behavior. I don't know how small the effects would be. It's sort of hard to know. But um, it's sort of hard to reason about what they might be, what their con what constraints are on them, because that's about the that's about the bulk Hilbert space of quantum gravity at, at, at the bottleneck of the sitter space. That's where these states live. So the hope is that by better understanding these considerations, one can gain a clearer picture, maybe even a computational framework for studying uh, a, a different initial states that you could then plug into the, the paradigm of inflationary cosmology and see how they would impact, for example, on um, the, uh, you know, cosmological correlators in the far future. So this is, you can kind of do toy versions of this in like lower dimensions, but, you know, you'd really want to do this in three plus one dimensions because that's the actual, you know, that's the physically relevant case. And, you know, I think that there's some promise that these ideas down the line can kind of really help us touch that question. So that's where I see it as connecting, potentially. Right, but uh, I think you are kind of uh, probably uh, avoiding the question because, in a way, uh, what you are now saying is that you start with only those initial conditions where the isometry is equivalent to a unitary, uh, because you already start in the port subspace. But suppose if your initial condition is indeed a hard locking, uh, like in the real unit, like suppose, su suppose. I mean, I don't know. Suppose it is some reason it is also viable, then you should see some uh, the real effect of isometry there, right? I mean, well, I mean, um, how do I say? Well, in a certain sense, some of this. Okay, well, well, well let me pose it to you as a question about the hartle hawking state. I don't know the answer. The question I'm going to ask you is a slightly rhetorical question. I don't know the answer, but uh, suppose it turns out that there is. So we're doing this calculation in three plus one dimensions. What if the hartle hawking state in three plus one dimensions, the one that we know and love, just is fundamentally a, a non-normalizable state? <laughs> like, just isn't a normalizable state in three plus one dimensions. Should we be worried about this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe it suggests that we should look at a different state, but I just mean, part of what this formalism gives you, by the way, I would say gives you two things, and, 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 and one of them may be more valuable than the other in practice. The isometry gives you intuition or, or gives you a framework to understand what the bulk, what the code subspace may look like. And what that looks like in higher dimensions is much more complicated than in JT gravity. And I can say some speculations about that. But the other thing, which I kind of slipped under the rug, but it's implicit actually in a lot of the analysis that I'm doing is that we actually now know how to compute the norm on asymptotic states in, in in the context of the sitter quantum gravity, like in the far future. That's why I'm making this gesture because it's in the far future. Um, that I, I think that there's a new insight about how to compute 
what the norm is on the Hilbert space. That's even why you can even ask the question of what is the norm of the Hartle Hawking state. You need to know how to do this computation. And I think that this idea of how to compute the norms on asymptotic states is also a very valuable tool. Um, certainly, uh, it impacts on certain questions and even computing certain features of cosmological correlators. Um, and uh, so I should mention that, okay, so, so let me say it like this way. I think what it will do, so here's an answer to your question. Usually when you do cosmology, you work in the inflating patch, but you could also work in global coordinates. It's just the, um, the, the, the it's, how do I say? The answers look extremely similar, <laughs> basically, because if we you can only make measurements of a certain small patch of the universe, you can't really tell the difference between the global and the static patch or sorry, not the static patch, um, inflating patch. Inflating patch is just like this kind of decompactification of the sphere. But the point is that if you want to compute the correct inner product on asym states and as asymptotic states and global coordinates, we what part of what the output of this work is that we realize that there's actually a subtlety in computing inner products on asymptotic states that would actually give you kind of corrections to the answer, to the naive answer that you would think. It, it sort of shows you how to even do it. And it would tell you that I don't know how big the effects are yet, but that in global coordinates, that there, there are, the, if, you, if you look at global slices, there is actually going to be small corrections to what you thought the cosmological correlators should have been. So that's one thing to say. Because when you compute cosmological correlators, you, you, you know, it's, you, you look at the wave functional, you put in some operators, and then you, you look at the bra and wave functional, you put in the cat, and then you compute expectation value. But this is all contingent on knowing what you mean by the inner product. And I'm saying that at least in the global slicing, there's actually a subtlety about how to compute the inner product that is not present in the inflating patch. So I don't know if that's that could be a very small effect because of course the inflating patch is very approximately correct anyway. So these could be very small effects, but that's that's at least something. But I think that the broader picture, just to say one other word, is that I want to understand more broadly what is the dictionary for holographic quantum gravity to sitter space. And I, I don't know where that will lead, but I, I hope that it will make contact in a certain way with understanding cosmology in the physical world, although I don't know. Okay. So usually people use the holography as some kind of a weak rotation of ATS, but this is not something probably, uh, uh, would that also, f uh, would, 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 you, would, would you do something like that in your approach? Or? Good, so, so you could ask the question, if you look at the ADS physics, uh, and you look at the, um, uh, so, um, how do I say? Uh, you could ask the following question. Here's a good way of putting it. If you took the Euclid, so the Wick rotation is usually between Euclidean ADS and Lorenzian to sitter. Okay. So um, you could ask the question, if you looked at Euclidean ADS, and you did a wick rotation, or like, it's not really a wick rotation exactly, but it's it's a continuation of certain parameters. Do you recover exactly Jakeev tidal blame gravity in, in, in Lorenzian to sitter space by doing certain kinds of continuations? And the interesting answer is that you don't exactly. There, there are certain things that you get wrong, which is quite interesting. So, this, this, so there, there are certain quantities for which it works, and there are other quantities for which it does not work. And, uh, that seems very interesting, and it's a subtlety. It's just that uh, it's a subtlety that people haven't realized. But I'm I'm not sure that it's, it was ever that important for anything that people were ever computing. But when you start to compute these things about S matrix amplitudes and about norms on states and so on, then these sort of failures of this kind of continuation become important. So I think that that's also something interesting. It's you can't you can't just uh, you can't just do some analytic continuation. There's something. There's other stuff that that that, uh, that that you will miss by doing that. Um, at least in the theories I was discussing in this talk, like JT gravity. Do you have this uh, uh, this 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 thing worked out in your papers, like this failure of this continuation? I would like to see yeah, where so, exactly uh, it fails. Yeah. So so Christian and I are writing. Uh, well, so. Yeah, so Christian and I actually are writing up a paper now, um, which will talk about this. In the Martin has worked out this Euclidean wormhole that you were mentioning. He said he has two Euclidean work. Uh, he has this work. Uh, or, who is this? Uh, Mark Heno. Mark Heno. Oh, Mark yeah. yeah, he has, a, he has, I think, worked out this Euclidean wormhole that, is, that connects this to ATS2. 
Sure. Well, I mean, this That's Euclidean the whole thing, there's yeah. also like, um, I mean, there's also the Saad Shanker Stanford work. I mean, there's various different things that people have done about this, but um, there's a certain sense in which there's a relation between the wormholes, but there's also like uh, some things which the continuation gets wrong. That, that, that's what I'm saying is sort of interesting. And uh, we've only sort of recently, like we've encountered it in various parts, but I, Christian and I have encountered the failure of this continuation from ADS to the sitter in various ways. But what's interesting is that uh, I think that we kind of figured out what the general story is of, 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 of why. What's that? Is it in your papers now or you're going to? So different features of the failure of the continuation are sort of mentioned as offhand comments in different papers. Um, but I think that we have a much more unified picture of it now, which is what we're working on writing up. At least for JT gravity. I mean, you know, that's so. It, it, it'll, there's also a similar story in two plus one dimensions. And I don't yet know fully what the, th the three plus one dimensional story is a lot more complicated. So you can say certain things that are also true, but it's more limited. But, but yeah, but I mean, I think it's quite interesting about how, I mean, it's, 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 it's actually very, it's very cool to, to see what are the quantities for which the continuation fails and exactly what's going on. I mean, it's quite, it's, yeah, that's quite interesting, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, any more questions from others? I, I had a question. If, if you, yeah, please. You don't mind. Yeah. So, so, so you mentioned you can see this in that matrix model as well, yeah. the, the non-unitarity. So, so I mean, I, I, I don't know much about this, but I understand that, that these like higher spin, I mean, maybe it's also related to this and the continuation, but higher spin gravities and desitter are, are maybe dual to vector models with ghost matter. I mean, oh. people, it is, it's okay. It, first of all, is, I mean, it, would it be possible to see this in that context also? Or? Yeah, like, so, well, I don't, yeah, so superficially they're different stories, but so separately with, other set of collaborators. I have been working on the uh, Vasiliev gravity story, it's higher spin story, and the duality between that and the uh, O of, you might call it the O of minus on model or the SPN model where you have anti-commuting scalars. Okay. Um, I don't yet know exactly what happens with that story, but, uh, but that's something that's in progress. Um, the matrix model story at the moment is a different story. I don't yet see how they connect, but they might connect. Um, but I don't have anything to say about that yet. But you, you would expect at least that that this bulk to asymptotic thing is an isometry. It should be possible to see that in the higher spin thing, or maybe because they're higher. Yeah, I, I think it should. Be different degree of more fields. I think I think it should be possible to see something like that. Uh, or, I mean, of course, you can get the, higher the fact spin. that there are so many more fields actually change this or, or not likely to change the conclusion? I mean. Well, it's a little harder. I mean, the funny thing about Vasily of gravity is that the funny thing about Vasily of gravity is that it's not like weakly coupled Einstein gravity. Like it's just a very different kind of thing. Like you can associate this spin two field with the graviton, but it's everything is sort of strongly coupled and strongly curved. Like it, so certain intuition. So so, so the short answer is I believe something like this also happens in the facility of gravity, but you have to be careful about the words you associate with it because it's just not like weakly coupled Einstein gravity. It's just uh, certain intuitions don't carry over to it. But I think that there is an analog of the things that I told you about here, which should happen in the facility of gravity, which you should be able to see in one way or another. So that's what I'm currently working on with some collaborators. But, but I, don't, I don't yet know what the final version of that story is. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, so if there is uh, no further question, we can close the talk officially. Thanks again for this wonderful talk. Oh, thank you again for having me. Very good. All right, I'll, I'll see you later.